You know, as important as mayflies are, they're only part of the fabric that's the food web of the trout. These tiny insects, the midges, are another thread in this biological mosaic. The midges have a life cycle that is different than that of the mayflies. There is a worm-like larva which develops to maturity in a few weeks. Though small, these insects are enormously abundant in lakes and streams throughout the range of the trout. In slow water areas, they can be the dominant trout food. Trout are well acquainted with this small but copious fare. This bare bones fly, the South Platte Brassy, and these dubbed fur imitations are very good representations of the larva. At maturity, the larva metamorphoses to become a pupa. This process takes a few days. The mature pupa then swims to the surface where the adult emerges. This is the time of the midge's life when it's most vulnerable to feeding trout. Now, this life cycle is the same as that of the butterfly. The caterpillar is a larva, and the chrysalis is a pupa. When the midges are hatching, the pupa form a raft of tiny morsels for the feeding trout. They are so abundant that the fish has little trouble finding enough to eat. The trout also become highly selective. But since the trout must feed very often to get enough pupa, you have many opportunities to fool the fish. This dubbed sparkle yarn pattern fished just under the film is very effective for taking midging trout. Adult midges look like thin mosquitoes with long bodies and short wings. Trout take the emerger and the adult just as readily as they'll take the pupa. This pattern, the Griffith's gnat, is the best fly I know of to mimic these stages. It can be left full to imitate the adult or trimmed flat on the bottom to represent the emerger. The rise to midges is slow, deliberate, and gentle. Often you'll see the fish's head and then its dorsal fin, and then its tail as it rises to take these tiny insects from the film. The English have called this head and tail rise a smutting rise. The presence of adult midges over the water and smutting trout should be your clues that some excellent midge fishing is at hand. Because the midges are so small and the fish's rise is so gentle, it's very difficult to tell whether fish are taking pupa or whether they're taking the adults. But if you watch very closely at a feeding fish, you can often see it pick an adult off the surface if it is, in fact, taking adults. These fish seem to be taking pupa right now, so I'm going to fish a pupal imitation just under the surface. The best tactic for this is the greased leader tactic. With this tactic, we just grease the leader with fly floatant. Just take some fly floatant, put it on your finger, and grease up the leader with it. Now, I start back about uh, eight or 10 inches from the fly when I'm fishing with a pupa. If I was fishing with a larval imitation, I wanted it to get a lot deeper. Then I would start back maybe three, four feet from the tippet and grease that whole leader right up, all the way to the end. So it floats right up on the surface, real high. We're gonna watch the leader use it as a strike indicator. All right, let's see if we can get down here and get one of these fish. In this very flat water like this, I'm using a long leader about 12 feet, and I have a three or four foot tippet on it so that I don't get any drag at all. And I like to cast up and across stream with this tactic, using the overhead cast, not the roll cast. The roll cast makes too much of a disturbance on the surface. And as the fly drifts back down, I use the stripping technique that I showed you earlier just to pick up the slack. And if the fish doesn't take the fly, just pick it up and cast it out again. I'm watching the track of the leader on the surface. If it should draw under very sharply, then I'm gonna set the hook. Now, I like to use this technique for midge pupae and midge larvae, but it's not obviously restricted to those techniques, or to those flies. You can use it for caddis pupa. you could use it for mayfly nymphs, any insect that's floating along underneath the surface. And when I'm fishing up and across like this, I lay that fly about four or five feet above the fish so that it has a chance to get through the film and sink down those four or five inches where I want it. There, no, nope. got a weed instead. Well, sometimes you get weeds. Got to expect those kind of things. Anytime that tippet goes under, set the hook because usually it's a fish. There it goes, got him. Good run. Get the rod down here.
pressure on it. This is where the value of a good reel comes in, one that turns very smoothly when that fish is running off line against the reel. If that reel turned the least bit harsh at all, break that fine tippet right off. I also like to have a reel that has capacity for at least 50 yards of backing, so if I get a really big fish that tears off a lot of line, you got some insurance. Come on, fish. Come on around here. Ah, oh, it's a nice rainbow. Come on. Get him in the net. Ah, with a grease leader tactic, it's in the bag. Oh, look at the colors on that fish. What a lovely fish. Back in here. When you're releasing a fish like this, if he's tired, you have an obligation to that fish to hold it until it's strong enough to be able to swim away. I just hold him like this in the water, face him upstream, and in slow current, don't get them in too fast current, or they'll tumble and get their nose down and get silt in their gills. Just hold them like this until they feel strong enough to swim out of your hands, and let them go. Looks good. Midges are very important in still water areas such as beaver ponds or lakes. The angling tactic for these areas are the same as for any flat water areas with one important exception. Because the current is so sluggish, the fish don't hold in one spot and wait for their food. They cruise about looking for it. In these areas, you've got to look for cruising lanes, not holding lies. These occur mostly at edges, along a weed bed, where shallows drop off into deep water, along steep banks, and so on. If you see fish feeding in such areas, cast the fly ahead of them. If you cast to the rise, you're casting where the fish was, not where it is. In shallow flats, trout will often cruise at random, taking nymphs from the bottom or floating insects from the surface. If you can see the fish, cast out well ahead of it so that it can come to the fly. But if the fish are just rising at random, the best thing to do is to cast the fly out, leave it sit out there for 30 or 40 seconds, then make another cast. Hopefully, the fish will find the fly while it's just sitting there. I see one coming. He's looking. He's got it. Oh, boy, did he take that. Nice fish. Oh, boy. And a fish. Oh, that's the end of that one. Well, when a fish jumps like that, you got to give him lots of slack. And he was tight on the line. I gave him all the slack I could, and he still broke me off. That's the way it goes sometimes. Some days you see fish rising, and there aren't any apparent hatches. Many times these fish are feeding on terrestrial insects that have either fallen or been blown from vegetation near the stream. Be especially mindful of this on windy summer days. Ants, jacids, beetles, inchworms, and grasshoppers can all be blown onto the stream or lake from overhanging trees and shrubs or nearby grasses and weeds. The rise to small terrestrial insects is soft and plucking much like the rise to midges or mayfly spinners. But the rise to grasshoppers and large beetles is bold and often very violent. Believe me, such rises can be startling and unnerving. In flat water, the terrestrials float, and the imitations are fished like any dry fly. In riffles, however, the insects are often drowned, and so the imitation should be fished upstream in a dead drift fashion. Some days when you're out fishing, you just don't see any surface activity. That doesn't mean the trout aren't alert for food. In many streams, the fish are very surface conscious and watch the film for food that may be floating by. During these blank periods, many anglers will fish the water with a dry fly, casting to good feeding lies and prime lies in hopes of luring a watchful trout. Terrestrial patterns are especially good for this tactic when fishing smooth flows.